Well, I have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Science. And that is to say, physics, medicine, nature, or space, time, the brain, life, the universe. Hello, you're listening to The Naked Scientists, the show where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science and technology. I'm Katie Haler. Now, given the current pandemic, we've been bringing you a lot of news about coronavirus recently. And all of us naked scientists hope you're doing okay in this difficult time. This episode, though, we've got a rather different show for you an oasis of calm and some rather light-hearted science. Here's a recording of a live event we did for the 2020 Cambridge Science Festival a few weeks ago. This was actually one of the last events of the festival before the remaining ones got cancelled, and it was recorded in Stories Field Centre at Eddington, Cambridge. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. So without further ado, I'll hand you over firstly to Adam Murphy and then Chris Smith. We are covering everything from chemistries to calories, from bugs to other planets. Things are going to explode. There will be fire. It will be great. So I'll leave it to Chris to introduce our first panellist. Giles Yeo, need I say more? Welcome to the stage, Giles Yeo. Giles is a geneticist. He's also an author. You occasionally see him pop up on the BBC. And actually, we were doing an event together a few years back, and Giles said to me, I've gone vegan, Chris, for an experiment for the BBC. And I said, how's it working out? He said, very windy. (laughs) (laughs) Pardon me, people haven't had dinner yet. Or maybe you have had dinner. Hello. (laughs) Well, speaking of dinner, we also have Cambridge University chemist, advisor to the chef's chocolate designer... An expert on all things at a very, very small scale. Please welcome to the stage Liliana Frook. Thank you. Hello, hello. We always end up talking about restaurants as well because yes. it, you're not just a chemist or a chemical engineer. You're, yeah. you're a bit good at food. I know. I like eating, so I thought maybe I turn my science into something good, experiments that can be eaten later on. And so <laughs> I ended up mixing up the chocolate. And you can imagine, I perfected the recipes for two years. You can imagine how enjoyable that was <laughs> in the lab. Also with us, volcano expert and professor of planetary geoscience at the Open University, David Rothery. <laughs> it's traditional to ask people who know about planets, say, what is your favourite planet? Is it Uranus? No, it's yeah. not. It's Mercury, because we have our own spacecraft on its way to Mercury as we speak. And you've helped pay for it, so thank you very much. <laughs> it's called BepiColombo. It's a European Space Agency mission joint with the Japanese Space Agency. And what's it going to do? It's going to go to Mercury, split into two spacecraft, the European one, the Japanese one, orbit the planet, but it won't get there until round about Christmas 2025. Wow, that's a long... It's not, well, it's, it's not it's, that far it, to Mercury, it's though, not, is it? Why so long? We set off away from the Earth. We're well, coming that was back a mistake, wasn't it? <laughs> well, no, because <laughs> it's rocket way. science. We're swinging back past the Earth next month. That swings us in towards the Sun. We have two flybys of Venus. And that swings us in past Mercury, but we're going too fast to get into orbit. So we fly past Mer- go around the Sun, flying past Mercury six or seven times, slowing down each time, thanks to Mercury's gravity, grabbing hold of our spacecraft a little bit. And the last time we approached Mercury, we're sneaking up on it slowly enough to get into orbit. Why didn't you just fly a bit slower in the first place? (laughs) You can't, because you're falling towards the sun all the way. So our iron drive, which is what propels us, is actually acting as brakes to slow us down all the time. And we can't carry enough fuel to screech to a halt if we want to carry instruments on board the spacecraft, which we do, because we want to find out what the planet's like when we get there. So you have to be, play these patient games in space. Wow. And last but not least, we have a Beatle enthusiast, an expert on woodlice personalities. Please welcome to the stage a tank. I mean, Eleanor, drink water. <laughs> now, Giles, we, we mentioned and alluded to the fact you do programmes on the BBC as mm-hmm. well. There must have been some times doing that when some funny things happened probably more for people watching me than for me. The one lesson, always read the waiver form. Just where the fact there's a waiver, 
is an issue. So I did an experiment uh, for, for Trust Me, My Doctor for what happens to your glucose levels, your blood sugar levels, when you get stressed. So for a week, I was wandering around with one of these glucose patches. You can actually do continuous blood glucose monitoring, and we were just figuring out what happened to my glucose after I ate. And so we then showed up on the experiment day. We had all this data, five days, of what happened to, after I ate to my, to my blood glucose levels. I ate. I looked at the waiver, which I didn't look before. I signed it. It said pain in there somewhere. This is always a bad thing. And then I showed up in the room, and there was a water bath at two degrees Celsius. So I walked in, and there was a po-faced, white-coated gentleman in front of me. And he said, stick your hand in the water. Remember, there's cameras on me, OK? So I stuck my hand in the water. And because a camera was on me, and I, there's children here, I nearly swore, but I didn't, okay? <laughs> it felt like my hand got chopped off. And so 90 seconds later, I then pulled my hand out, and the guy goes, subtract 37 from 1,889 sequentially. So I'm sitting there with my hand falling off, <laughs> trying to make the decision, and, and, and he yells at me for being slow, for, for shaking my leg, hand back in, hand out, hand in, hand out. Very stressful. But what was really interesting was what happened to my glucose levels. So normally when you eat, your blood glucose levels go up, and then they come back down again as long as you don't have diabetes, and I don't have diabetes. But what was interesting was as they went up after I ate and was coming back down, the moment I stuck my hand into that ice cold water, okay, the moment I got stressed, my blood glucose levels came to a screeching halt. <laughs> it took nearly two hours to go down to what it was at fasting. Why? Because when you're stressed, suddenly you're thinking, tiger, 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 right? And so your body then keeps the glucose levels in your blood so that you have fuel to run from the tiger, to hit someone, whatever you're supposed to do. Biology at work, I knew it because I study it, but it was very interesting to see. Eleanor. I, I, I can't understand how someone managed to talk you into this. You're probably <laughs> one of the smartest people I've ever met. And <laughs> I didn't read the waiver. <laughs> <laughs> that being the, that being the, oh, but the, the, oh, the other thing was they couldn't tell me what the stress was to make sure I was super stressed. I think that's probably the other thing. So I didn't actually know what I was walking into. Mm. Now, Liliana, as we mentioned, you are a chocolate designer. Mm. How does an engineer at the tiny scales start working in chocolate? Yeah, as I said at the beginning, I really wanted to do some chemistry where you know you have a result that is really desirable to other people because chemistry has sometimes such a bad reputation that we are doing bad things. And I thought, <laughs> let, let me make a souvenir that people can take with them, eat it, and then learn about the molecules. So we designed molecular chocolates. And it seems to be working. People are coming to me and asking me about dopamine and <laughs> glucose and ethanol, all of these molecules that we embedded within now, our chocolate. The last chocolate. one of those I can definitely identify with. Yeah? <laughs> yes. Because, of course, that is, for people who are not in the know, that is alcohol. Of I course. know. David? So chocolate is a long-chain carbon molecule, basically, yeah? But, but there's something that forms in the atmosphere of Pluto and settles yeah. to the ground and stains Pluto brown, which we think is a kind of hydrocarbon. Do you think it's possibly worth going to have a lick? <laughs> I, think, I think we should name it together. You know what? It is well, in the Milky Way. Oh. Oh, Other chocolate bars <laughs> are available. <laughs> As someone who has been working, because you work with the BBC quite a bit as well. Yeah. Have you got any interesting things to relate? You want me to tell you about fun and games with Brian Cox on the Planet I don't know, series? You can't <laughs> <laughs> there was an Open University co production called The Planets, which aired about 10 months ago. And two of us at the Open University, planetary scientists, were consultants. And we would get the drafts of the scripts and tell them what was wrong with it and how to put it right. This is a production company. I meant to go to Brian Cox, and he'd go, he'd be, he'd go off in a glider over the Alps or on some glacier in Iceland, somewhere atmospheric, to do his pieces to camera. And he often went off script on those, so we couldn't really control what he said. But he knows his stuff, by and large. He's a particle physicist, rather than a planetary scientist. <laughs> but he did a lovely piece with an iPad on a glacier in Iceland, saying, look at this picture of Uranus, your favourite planet, Chris, with these <laughs> rings... No comment. <laughs> and, and two little moons, one outside the ring, one inside. Was, these were shepherd moons. And the thing about the very narrow rings which Uranus has is that the moon orbiting inside and outside help keep that ring really narrow and keep it in shape. They're called shepherd moons. And Brian was explaining very eloquently how the outer moon going a little bit faster tugs the rings upwards and the inner moon going a bit slower tugs the rings downwards. And between that keeps the ring in shape. And it was very persuasive, very well done. He's 
talks to camera beautifully. And when I saw the rush for this, the recording that comes for approval, I thought, that's great, he's done well. It's not what we planned, but it came over really well. It was broadcast. And then people on Twitter were saying, that was wrong, because the inner ones go faster than the outer ones. Anything orbiting something, the closer you are, the fa faster you go. So he got the principle right of the tugs in opposite directions keeping the rings tight. He just got the relative speeds wrong. So you, and you didn't read the small print then, I, 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 was, <laughs> I was seduced by Brian's brilliant delivery, but people watching television spotted it. They tweeted, and I said, oh, yes, we got it wrong. And then Brian tweeted, saying, yes, sorry, I got it wrong. And it's even more stupid because I did a master's project on these very shepherd moons doing this. But, but mm. when you're telling a story, it's very easy to just tell it the wrong way around. You concentrate on explaining the opposing forces, doing a good job, and you can get something fundamentally wrong and not realise it. That's why your space probe's going to take 15 million years to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I did exactly the same thing once, where it, literally it was, a, it was a graph. Now, this isn't even complex. It wasn't moving. It was just a graph with a blue line going up, a red line going down. And I said, look at the red line going up. It went all the way, except for one thing. They ended up catching it the night before it went out. I had to rush Ooh. down to a, uh, to a studio. <laughs> actually came to, to the, the Naked Scientist studio, actually, in order to record record one line, and I, that's just, just say down, just say down. I went, <laughs> down. And they spliced that down in, and I said it <clears throat> correctly. <laughs> now, now, Eleanor, you come on The Naked Scientist quite often because you are our insect guest. You are a creepy-crawly expert. Right, thank you. And you agree <laughs> kindly because you've come back and we're delighted you're back in Cambridge and you have brought us a surprise. Yes, I have. So whenever I, I talk about science, one of the things I'm really keen about is trying to get people to realise how brilliant invertebrates are. And so I thought the best way to do this was to bring along a guest... This is Sherlock Holmes. Did you say Sherlock Holmes? Yeah, Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's too funny. Um, <laughs> so Sherlock Holmes is a East African land snail. Uh, whoops, thank you. Um, was, was an East African <laughs> <laughs> no, that wasn't. That wasn't him, it's fine. Here we go, I'll just see if you can see him a bit better if I move away some of his uh, salad. Um, <laughs> It's got quite a banquet there. I know. Uh, yeah, exactly. No wonder it's so big. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, so when he's fully spread out, he gets to about 18 centimetres long. Um, and the really, really crazy thing about uh, this uh, species is they reach that size in about a year. So that means they have this incredible need to try and find as much calcium as they can. So in the wild, you'll find them scavenging for bones of dead animals in order to try and get as much calcium as they possibly can. Mm. Or sometimes concrete. They'll go for a little bit of concrete oh. as well. So they are taking this calcium from the bones, which means they mm. probably have some kind of chemicals in their slime that can dissolve this bone structure. I don't know exactly how they do it. Because they don't have teeth. Oh, yeah. But they, they do, they have these lovely mouth parts though. When you watch them eat, they've kind of got this, um, it's almost like a kind of, you'll see it like a little pumice stone kind of scratching off the, the, the layers. And one of the other lovely things about this is, so in the wild they tend to be a lovely kind of dark grey, brown colour. Well, this one's albino. And so as a result, you can actually see when he eats, you get kind of little globules of food that you can see coming through its skin because the skin is actually transparent, which is another reason why, yeah, they're, they're just, just amazing. Um, Good job that doesn't happen to humans. Like, <laughs> but, so tell me, Ellen, I'm intrigued. Does a fat big snail like that yep. travel at the same speed as a small one? Or, or is there a speed advantage with a big Ooh, snail? That is a very good question. Um, I would have to say that I don't know, but I do know that snails aren't known for their speeding ability. Yeah. Um, well, you see, the, 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 no, I've got a vested interest, because yes. I was taking part in a snail race the other day. <laughs> we are all racing snails. And, and you, mine yeah. was going really slowly. And so I said, should I take the shell off? Because I thought that would lighten the weight. And the person who was with me said, no, that'll make it more sluggish. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> Give them all a round of applause, everybody. Our wonderful panel for this evening. Hiya, I'm Phil Sansom, and I host the Naked Genetics podcast. Genetics is huge right now. From those home DNA testing kits to futuristic gene therapies to treat diseases. And if, like me, you're just trying to get a grip on what genes can and can't tell you, then this might be the show for you. Each month, we are telling scientific detective stories and shining a light in directions you might not expect, like gene sequencing a puppy. Bruce? 
biscuit. Or maybe tearing apart a flower. Oh boy, you've taken all the parts off. Well, that one I messed up, so that shows you how, <laughs> how good he had to get at this. And even drinking a bunch of gin. <laughs> Very refreshing. Don't miss out. Subscribe to Naked Genetics wherever you get your podcasts. This week, we're bringing you a recording of our live event from the Cambridge Science Festival that was recorded back on the 11th of March, featuring geneticist Giles Yeo, chemist Liliana Frook, planetary geoscientist David Rothery, and animal behaviour expert Eleanor Drinkwater. So let's dive back in with Chris Smith. Now, Giles, we really should dwell on your science a, a little bit. So you are a geneticist. I am. So tell us what you actually apply your genetics to. So I'm actually a, gen I'm a geneticist and a perfectly upstanding thing to do. You know, my mother-in-law still speaks to me, so this is a good thing. Um, <laughs> but, but people often use genetics to study a trait um, or a disease, and I happen to study body weight. And actually, the moment I say body weight, obesity, actually, of which is one end of the spectrum, I suddenly become the bad person. And I become the bad person because I'm perceived as giving fat people, overweight people, people with obesity an excuse which is always an interesting take, because if, if I was studying the genetics of cancer, would I be giving the cancer patient an excuse? I wouldn't. And the reason why I'm bad is because people understand this, right? People say that, well, but, but you eat too much. That's why you're, you're, you're the size you are. You eat too much, right? Well, they so, say that to you. Choice. They say that to me. Thank you. I lost weight, I want to point out, when I was vegan. <laughs> anyway, so, so but, but when they, when they eat too much. And, and that is true. Your body weight is going to be down to how much you eat and how much you burn, right? But that, the question to ask is why? And at the end of the day, it's because different people behave very, very differently around food. And there is a lot of genes that are actually involved. The physics is the first law of thermodynamics. You can't magic the calories in and magic the calories away. But it's working up to the physics. Why we actually get to the physics we get, why we eat too much, that's where the biology is. And I think by studying extreme uh, uh, cases of obesity, so th these are not going to be normal cases of obesity. These are three, four-year-old children who are 40, 50 kilograms. Okay, so this, that's, a lot, that's a lot of weight. I'm 75 kilograms. For example, one of the pathways we know that are disrupted in severe obesity is the fat-sensing pathway, where because there's a lack of a signal from the fat to the brain, the brain doesn't know that you have enough fat on you, and so you continue actually, actually, actually. And that using. is genetic. There, that is there's genetic. a genetic reason why your fat doesn't talk properly to your brain, and that makes you eat too much. Exactly. There's a hormone there called leptin, and when there's actually a mutation in the hormone leptin, then and, and you don't, uh, uh, you know, have any leptin, then your brain doesn't know how much fat you have. Now, how much fat you uh, have? The thing is, Charles, right? Mm. Why I'm slightly skeptical, and you yeah. can probably disabuse me of my skepticism, is that 50 years ago, the number of people who were overweight and obese was vanishingly small. And now it's very, very large. Now, we're not evolving that fast, are we? We're not evolving So that why is there a difference? Whenever people study, talk about genes, they think that geneticists only look at the genes in of themselves. And we do look at the genes. But we have to look at the genes in context with the environment. It turns out that every single human trait, as, including our body weight, has a genetic influence. Every single uh, trait and behavior. The trick is to ask what role the environment plays. Now, your genes, as you say, they're empirical. You're born with them, you die with them, they don't change anywhere in between. But the environment does. And as the environment changes, the way your genes uh, express themselves and change actually then, then changes as well. And so what has happened is, as we get to the stage where we're at, and we have too much food today, I think that's not anything to debate, suddenly it has unmasked susceptibilities of certain people you know, who are going to eat more in the environment. Whereas in the past there was just not enough food around for people to eat too much, whereas now there is ample opportunity for people then to take advantage of the environment or not advantage, depending on what you look at, and actually get too large. Now, as we said, we promised you demos, and it wouldn't be a proper Naked Scientist show without them. So I'd like to introduce science demo superstar and former Naked Scientist, who's going to put the boom in this show. Please give a round of applause for Dave Ansel. So Dave, we're talking about food and we're talking about calories. So what kind of food calorie related demos have you got for us? I thought we'd look at releasing those calories in a slightly different way. Right, oh, so not in oh, eating. Not, not quite the way you do it within your body, but as a physicist in a very similar way. Okay. So your body basically, as far as I'm as a physicist is concerned, you take in energy, you react that with some oxygen and does something useful with it. So what does that look like? So here I have a pot with some vegetable oil in it and a string coming out the top. Just like a candle wick? Just like a candle wick. 
If I light it, we have a really exciting demo. <gasps> it's a small candle flame. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, it's a small candle flame. So this is going to sit there maybe for a couple of hours and burn gently. It's the way a lot of light was produced in the ancient world. But is there anything else we can do with food? Well, so this is releasing quite a lot of energy over a very long period, so it's not that exciting. What I thought we'd try and do is increase the speed at which we release that energy. Now we're talking, okay. (laughs) Thus increasing the power and doing something a bit more exciting. So in order to burn something quickly, you need to be able to get the oxygen to more of it at once. Yeah. So the way you do that is by using very, very small particles. So like a powder? So like a powder, like custard powder. I do love custard, so I'm enjoying where this is going. (laughs) Um, So the particles in custard powder, they're basically starch, they're corn flour, and they're about one micron across, so one thousandth of a millimetre across. So if you imagine the surface area of all of these tiny, tiny particles, it's absolutely immense. And so basically, if you can get the oxygen to custard powder, it can burn almost everywhere at once. And he asks dramatically, what might that look like? (laughs) (laughs) First, we need a device for doing this. It looks a little bit like a pipe, and I put a little bit of custard powder in this, and there's a long tube attached to that, and we need a source of ignition. So I will light this blowtorch. I'm a coward, so I'm stealing your goggles. And then if I blow through this tube, the air will swirl in here, mix the air in really nicely with the corn flour. And kneeling down in front of it, about to blow through the pipe, and... We get a very cool little fireball just flumed and up. At this scale, that's kind of pretty. If you're running a flour mill, it's a whole other kettle of fish. If, say, you have a big bag of flour, it drops down from the top of your flour mill, it bursts, it fills the whole flour mill with um, flour, which is the same stuff as corn flour, basically, all carbohydrates. There's a flame in the corner, bang. Hundreds and hundreds of um, windmills and other forms of mills blew up through that very reason. They were incredibly paranoid about um, not having flames in mills for good reason. And that's certainly not what I want to happen while I'm having cake anyway. Now, Giles, maybe I'm in the minority here, but I feel like when I put a donut into myself, it doesn't burn up in a big fireball. So what's different about what my body's doing to turn food into energy. Mm. So actually, it's, it's very interesting because when you eat food, we think about it in calories, right? We think, oh, this is 100 calories, this is 200 calories. And what's interesting is a calorie is the amount of energy it takes to raise one liter of water, one degree Celsius at sea level. That's a calorie, okay? But if you think about it, then how many calories do you need to boil one liter of water? The answer is 100 calories. A chocolate bar only has 230 calories, and we're not boiling. The way that our body actually does it is we then take that food and transform it into into energy, but in stepwise forms. So if we're taking fat and sugar and protein, we actually absorb it. It then goes through what we call intermediary metabolism, which means that the individual glucose particles, amino acids, uh, and fatty acid particles then produce ATP, okay, which, is, which, which is our little units of energy. And each of these then gives a little puff of energy every time they break apart to then be able to move certain things. And we actually recycle in our body our entire body weight in ATP, in these little things, every single day in order to function. Now, ATP, I, I remember when Mars bars were only 20p. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's <very> expensive. <laughs> Who brought him here? <laughs> no, you did, you did. Quick question for you, Giles. Where's Sue, Sue Taylor? What do you want to ask Giles, Sue? Question about Benicol. Does it actually work? <laughs> uh, Benicol and things like proactive margarine, do they actually work? Other spreads are available, but these... Uh, come on the, uh, with the manufacturer side that says l- helps lower cholesterol, help being the, 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 the critical word, and lower cholesterol. Now, I'm not entirely sure what the active ingredient is supposed to be in, in these things, but as far as I understand, there is a modest effect in some people, okay? And this is the critical thing, because not everybody's cholesterol levels are going to be sensitive to diet. Mm. To my view, rather than eating a lot of spread, which is fine if you, if you dig spread, I guess, um, <laughs> I, I think if you actually reduce your saturated fats and ate more unsaturated fats, such as from olive oil and maybe from ground nuts, that's probably going to be more effective on lowering your cholesterol levels if, if your cholesterol levels is sensitive to diet. Hands up in the room if you prefer butter to marge. Or, you know, I, oh, it's about half and half. It's split down the middle. Sue, you had another question. 
Yeah, is butter better? Yes. <laughs> so half the room agree that they prefer the taste, but Giles, what about the health? Once again, it does depend who you are. All right, there are going to be some people who can literally uh, uh, take a stick of butter and, and, and eat it, and their cholesterol levels will not budge. Okay, and those are you can call them lucky people. They may get fat. Though. That's a very different scenario. Okay, <laughs> a, a different problem. But from the heart perspective. But there are going to be some people, and I know I'm one of them. My cholesterol levels teeter on, on a little bit high. I know they're sensitive because when I went on a vegan diet and cut up my saturated fats, my cholesterol levels plummeted. So if I ate a stick of butter, I'd probably keel over from a coronary. So once again, I think it is very, very important when you begin to ask questions about food and, and that it doesn't it work the same in every single person. So it depends. It's the answer. Thank you. And Giles Yeo, thank you very much. Now, sitting to my right, and we've been talking about food, it seems appropriate to move on to the ways in which the body <clears throat> releases the energy in food. And one way it does that is to use digestive enzymes. And Liliana Frook, mm. you're very much into your enzymes, but tell people what they actually are. And yeah, how they work. we work on extreme small scales. So we use nanotechnology, it's very small dimensions. We work with materials which we can pack in such a way that they resemble the sizes of our biomolecules in our organism. And enzymes are really extremely good chemists. So they are responsible for speeding up reactions in nature. And they are also very specific. That means that they can choose one reaction sometimes out of many reactions and just specialize on this one. But then they specialize perfectly. And you can imagine that these enzymes are then particularly useful for chemical industry. If we could design enzymes that could help us to do these reactions that we need to produce clothing or produce some food, we would be really happy because we will reduce the waste. They are usually biodegradable. So we try to take the inspiration from natural enzymes, those which are present in our organism or in some plants and animals, and we try to simplify them so that we can design materials which are relatively cheap, but they can still do the reactions that we would need. So, for example, we design the, the simplified enzyme that can make indigo dye. And indigo dye is, for example, a blue dye that you use in your clothing. So everybody who has a little bit of a genes today definitely has the indigo dye. And this is produced in chemical industry with numerous processes that produce lots of waste. If you use enzyme, you simplify these reactions. Instead of having 20 reaction sequences to get this indigo, you now you have three. You work with the reagents which are really sustainable. So this is what we do. Yeah, I have a demo. Enzymes in action. Exactly. And you know, before we were using oxygen to burn the things. Now I am going to use the enzyme to produce the oxygen. And this will do, hopefully, it will do well. I have my lovely assistant here. I'll to take the glasses. Safety first. I have also a lab coat, which all chemists should have. And I have gloves. And what I have here, and you see, especially a little bit special treatment, I have a very big flask, and there are some small flasks <laughs> here. I have hydrogen peroxide in this flask. And hydrogen peroxide is similar to water. So water has one oxygen and two hydrogens. Hydrogen peroxide has one additional oxygen, which makes it a little bit more reactive but it makes it also very good for different household uh, activities. So you probably, if you look in your kitchen or in your bathroom, you might find some products, cleaning products that have hydrogen peroxide. So what I have then here, it's a mix of yeast, normal baking yeast, has enzyme called catalase. It's a very powerful enzyme. It works really within the second, and it can degrade this hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So let's see if we can make this reaction go. So we're gonna pour the yeast into this flask full of peroxide. Yes. Woo! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so what we actually get here, and if you would touch this flask now, you would realize that it's really hot and, and you can see it foaming. 
So oh, a foam just shot out of the top. So. Yes. So <laughs> we put a little bit of detergent in it, a little bit of soap, so that we created the foam. Liliana, but is that science speak for we cheated? Is yeah. that what <laughs> yeah, it's because, you know, I wanted to make it visualize. How would you see the oxygen? Oxygen you can't see. So we made oxygen visible. So you have lots of oxygen produced, and this reaction also releases lots of energy. So basically everything heats up. I noticed there are four more flasks. I know. <laughs> yes. I need four volunteers from the audience. Yes. Oh my God. Who's going to be faster? How are we going to choose? Yeah, you have to put some gla uh, glasses Safety first. On. We need lab Safety. equipment. Lab coats on. Science is the most okay. glamorous activity in the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Purple gloves, matching white coats. Okay. This year from Ralph Lauren. Yes, and then you have your purple gloves. Okay, take the position. Choose your flask. Choose wisely. And choose <laughs> wisely. So you do have your flasks, which we prepared already, because we put a little bit of hydrogen peroxide in the flask. And we put a little bit of soap. I will move out of the way. Here you have your mix of the enzyme. So it's the yeast. You need to... Start your reaction by pouring the enzyme into your mix. Are we ready? Go, go. Go, 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 go. Yay! Woo! Oh, wow. <laughs> That's much better than I have done. Wow, look at that foam. What did you think of that, David, David Rothery? Was, I mean, I've asked you about your favorite, favorite planet. Have you got a favorite experiment? Well, that was fun. I mean, watching that liquid turn to foam, which expanded its volume and causing it to shoot up through the long necks of those flasks was a very good physical analogue of what happens inside volcanoes. The chemistry is different, but when you have a liquid, when a, a sudden amount of gas gets formed and it forms bubbles and it changes the volume, it can drive stuff upwards. That's why volcanoes erupt, because the, the gases dissolved in the magma come out of solution, turn it to foam, and push it up the conduit of a volcano. If it's more explosive than what we saw here, it can break that foam into fragments, and that's what volcanic ash would be, but he very sensibly controlled it here so it didn't break into fragments and was just a foam and spilled out like bubbly lava. Mm. But, but, but the physics behind what you showed there is the same as happens in volcanoes. Mm. It's just gas expanding the volume and driving the molten stuff up the, up the pipe to the yeah. surface. Uh, quick question for Liliana. Now, where's Joe? Joe says he's 10 and wants to ask about famous chocolate bars. Where are you, Joe? Um, what's the most famous chocolate bar you've worked on? <laughs> ah, that's a trick question. So I didn't work on any of the brands you will know, but I have here one chocolate, which I think it's going to be very famous soon. <laughs> and this is a chocolate which we developed to celebrate a birthday of Nikola Tesla, who's a famous physicist. And he has done lots of experiments with electricity. And he comes from a, a region in Europe which is famous for plums and berries. So we designed a chocolate, which is very delicious, which has plums and berries. So this is my next famous chocolate that I'm going to work on. <laughs> now, when you say you designed the chocolate, do you mean you fiddled with the recipe or you used some of your magic enzymes? In what way did you yes. design it? Yes, so we do fiddle with a kind of types of the chocolates, cocoa beans that we take. We play a little bit around with the mixing of the chocolate, with the ingredients. And if you want to get a soft, a liquidy core in your chocolate, you actually use an enzyme. Talk nicely to Liliana at the end, Joe. She might give you a bit of her famous chocolate bar. The Naked Scientists podcast is produced in association with Spitfire. Cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. Music in the program is sponsored by Epidemic Sound. Perfect music for audio and video productions. And today, Adam Murphy, Chris Smith and me, Katie Haler, are indulging in some cheery chemistry, genetics, animal science and geoscience from our Cambridge Science Festival event earlier on in March. So I'll hand you back to Chris Smith and David Rothery. Now, David, you told us some interesting insights into the Bepi Colombo mission and Mercury at the beginning. 
So chance now to dwell a bit more on that theme. So first of all, tell us how you got involved in that, because it's not everyone who gets to, to send a space probe to another planet. Oh, I was invited to go to Paris to make the geological case for going to Mercury in 1997 because the guy who was meant to go couldn't make it and I got roped in. And I was thinking, Mercury's a boring place, but hey, we've only had one spacecraft there, <laughs> so we really ought to go and take another look. Since then, we've had NASA's mission, Messenger, which orbited Mercury and produced wonderful data. And we now know Mercury's a planet which just doesn't fit. It's the closest one to the sun. It's rocky, but it's got a lot of volatile substances there. We don't know what they all are. We've measured a lot of sulfur, which is a surprise. You wouldn't think that close to the sun, sulfur would condense. But there's all these visible signs on the surface. It's what there have been exploding volcanoes, mm. where something in the magma is turning to gas and blasting great holes in the surface. We don't know what that substance is that's available to turn into gas in volcanic eruptions. What's but it actually like on Mercury, though? If, if we were to go there, not that we could, but if we were to go there, what would it be like? If you were standing on the surface of Mercury, it would look like standing on the surface of a moon. It's airless, it's bare rock, but most of the rock is broken up to powder by continual bombardment by meteorites hitting the surface, so it's very powdery. You might find a few fist-sized lumps of rock, but no cliffs of solid rock. The outer part is all very powdery. But it's not so badly mixed that there are no compositional variations. We do know the composition varies from place to place, and it's been resurfaced by lava flows. And then what's happening today in some places is either the heat or the sunlight or the, the solar wind is attacking the surface and turning some of it to vapour because we've got steep-sided, flat-bottom depressions, 20 metres deep, that's all, widening with cliffs at their edges, getting wider with time taking the top 20 metres of the surface away, and we don't know how it's happening. We what's don't know what's being lost. How hot is it there? By if I, if I had a thermometer, noon, yeah. what would it read? Noon time, about 400 degrees. By night, mm. about minus 150. So it's a quite wide temperature range. When you say night time, is it, is it turning like Earth is or not? It is turning. It rotates on its axis three times for every two orbits it makes around the sun. So the day is, is longer than the, than well, the year? Three spins for two orbits actually makes the day, measured from the sun, <laughs> twice as long as each year. That's so bizarre, sunrise to sunrise is two Mercury years, which is um, 176 Earth days. It's, so we've got wild temperature extremes, slow spin, uh, and weird things happening on the mm. surface, which we do not understand, but we'll mm. measure them much better when Bepi Colombo gets there, we hope. Mm. Yeah, yeah. After 15 years in space. I'm sorry, I'm just... Well, no, it's, it's, it's about a nine-year cruise and then at least a year working in orbit. And then you hope it wakes up at the end of that because that's obviously no, a risk, isn't it? it when the probe is, is mobile through space, of course, you hope it's going to work when it gets there because you've got no way to control it. It hasn't really. been turned off during cruise. It, the instruments are being tested. When it comes back past the Earth... In mid-April, we'll run some experiments, and the two Venus flybys will, will collect data. But because it's two spacecraft travelling together, the in, most of the instruments can't see the sky properly, so it won't be operating in full operational mode when we fly by Venus, or when we fly by Mercury several times. It's only when we get into orbit and separate the spacecraft and point the instruments down to the ground that we start getting our real science. But How's it we do powered? know it's working. How's what, it has it got batteries or solar no, panels? How are you powering solar it? panels. Yeah. The panels to power it when we're in orbit around Mercury, and while it's going to Mercury, powered by the ion drive, it's solar electric propulsion. We've got seven-metre-long solar panels either side of the spacecraft, and blimey, that was tense when we got into orbit and unfold them. I was thinking, if they don't open out, we're in trouble, but they did. We collect electricity from sunlight, use that to ionise xenon gas which is vented out through the exhaust very fast, and that's our iron drive, xenon ions. It's basically the Starfleet mm. impulse drive. <laughs> yeah. So we move to our next demo, which appears to be a stool sitting on a DJ turntable. Dave, <laughs> what have we got going on here? I thought I would pretend to be a spacecraft. You're gonna be what kind of spacecraft? It doesn't really matter. Okay. Any oh, spacecraft. Be, be, be Beppe Colombo. <laughs> <laughs> be okay, Beppe Colombo, what have we got going on here? So I have a problem. If I'm standing up normally and I want to turn around, all I do is I push on the floor. The floor gives an equal opposite reaction to me, and I turn around. Push, go. Yeah, dead easy. Problem is, if you're in space, you've got nothing to push against. Right. 
So this spinny stool is a good model of a spacecraft in one particular way. And that is, I can't apply any forces to the outside world. And so I can try and turn around, and all I do is just kind of wiggle. I assume spacecraft don't actually wiggle. <laughs> <laughs> no, because engineers have worked out a solution to this problem. So what is that solution? What they have is a wheel. A bike wheel. Probably not a bike wheel, something with more expensive and with better engineering in it. So what I can do now is if I want to turn around, I can apply a force to the bike wheel. So if I push one way, the bike wheel applies a force to me in the opposite direction, and I turn around. If I stop the wheel, I stop. If I spin the wheel the other way, I spin the other way. By doing this, you can so you turn around the spacecraft and then stop. Is this what spacecraft are doing to turn around? Exactly. They have normally yeah. at least three wheels on different axes. They can spin them up and slow them down and turn around. And there's probably some horrific gyroscopic effects, which I don't want to think about. But luckily, it's someone else's engineering problem. <laughs> Space is complicated. <laughs> Indeed. The problem is, if there's a force on you from solar wind or even just light, light will apply a force to you. You start moving, you can spin your wheel up and kind of slow yourself down. But the problem is, at some point, you get to the point where you can't spin the wheel fast enough to stop moving. At which point, you have a problem. They solve it for a while by throwing stuff out. The highly scientific bags <laughs> of rice. So I thought I would... My model of a rocket is to have a bag of rice. If I'm turning this way and I throw a bag of rice down, I can slow myself down a bit. Instead of throwing bags of rice, obviously you use hot gases in a rocket. But it's the same principle. You push something that way, it pushes you back, you stop moving. So you can slow yourself down and you can slow your gyroscopes down. And all's great until the forces build up and you run out of fuel. At which point your spacecraft's dead. Because if the spacecraft can't, doesn't know where it's pointing and can't point at things, it's almost useless. You can't point your antenna back to home. You can't use your rockets to point in the right direction. Your spacecraft's dead. I suppose if you want your telescope taking photos of stars, you don't want it pointed at your house. Or spinning round very fast. <laughs> it would be even worse. Nice pictures, though. So... Dave, you mentioned Bebe Colombo is going to split in half as it goes around. How is it going to control doing that? It's built in two parts. The Japanese one will be spun up and set loose, and the European one uh, will be concentrating on looking at the surface. It has reaction wheels to flip it round. I mean, it's quite right. All spacecraft that uh, need to point in different directions use these reaction wheels because you can get electricity from the sun to drive them and you can use those to steer you without having to vent rocket fuel all the time. Yeah, Similar it's an excellent demonstration of how spacecraft are steered. Amazing, thank you. Now, where's Dan G, who's aged 11? Because Dan's got a question for you, David Rothery, about volcanoes. Hello. How many volcanoes are in the solar system? Ooh. OK, Dan, do you mean volcanoes that are still erupting or that are extinct? Uh, that are still erupting. Are still erupting. Okay, that's easier. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On Earth, that have erupted in the past 10,000 years, and that might still erupt, there are several hundreds. On Jupiter's moon Io, there are, again, hundreds which are erupting. And they, these are both erupting molten rock. There are volcanoes, if you want to call them that, on Saturn's moon, <laughs> Enceladus, which is venting ice particles to space, like an explosive eruption. They're called cryovolcanoes, icy volcanoes. And there are several fissures near the South Pole are venting those. Those are the active places for volcanism and cryovolcanism. And then Mercury's got 100 or so of these explosive volcanoes that I mentioned just now. But they're extinct. They're not operating today and unlikely to erupt ever again. Almost every rocky surface, Venus, we think, might have active volcanoes today. There's a big push to get another mission back to Venus, which can nail that. But the whole surface of Venus, 90% of it, is made of volcanic rocks. Which, so they've been erupted from volcanoes. So volcanoes are everywhere, on icy moons, on rocky moons, and on rocky planets. It's a very important process in forming the crust of a planet to begin with. David Rothery, thank you very much. So, Eleanor, we had a quiz on the Naked Scientists the other day, and one of the questions was that all the spiders on Earth could eat all the humans on Earth in a year. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you know what the answer was? No, I don't, but I would love to know the answer. What Who was... thinks it's true? Hands up if you think it's true. A handful. Oh, yes. a ha Liliana thinks it's true. So a handful of people think it's true. I, Actually, I... it's true. You could, because if you work out there are how many hundreds of millions of spiders there are, 
and how much a spider eats. When you scale that to the population of spiders on Earth, they, they would actually easily devour all 7.7 .7 billion humans in under a year. The, but mm -hmm. the question is, would they want to? Because, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, a, a fly or, or something like that, to many spiders, would be very tasty. But take a look at a human. You know, we're a bit disgusting in comparison, you know? So I think that's so the other question. So what you're saying, human, blue bottle, you'd rather eat a blue bottle? <laughs> If I was a spider. <laughs> Easier to catch. <laughs> but where I was going with this, there, there are extraordinary numbers. When we actually add up the scale of the insect world, of the microscopic world, yep. it's enormous in terms yep. of the numbers, isn't it? Yeah, I absolutely love thinking about it. So, so for example, insects alone, this is not including anybody like snails or, 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 or anything like that, just insects alone. We know about one million species on the planet, but... Actually, estimates put the actual number of species at about 10 million. So just the number of uh, undescribed species is absolutely phenomenal. And that's just species. If you've got a giant set of weighing scales and you put all of the insects, again, just insects, no, none of the snails or anything like that, just insects on one side of the weighing scales and all the people on the other side of the weighing scales, the insects would probably weigh about 70 times the amount of people, which is just wonderful to think about. Liliana? Yeah, I just wanted to say, and we are still learning so much yeah. from insects. For example, there is a new type of colors that we make, new types yeah. of kind of dye-like materials that were inspired by butterflies yeah. and the way how they create their own colors. Or spiders. We are working now also in my lab a little bit with materials which are inspired by silk that spiders make. Yeah. So they make an amazing number of chemicals and structures that that we are really learning about them yeah. now. And the, the, the thing that always just I find phenomenal is the fact that we just know so little about so many, even of the really big charismatic species, like, you know, my favourite beetle is, is the titan beetle, biggest beetle on the planet. No one has ever seen its larvae. How big is it? So it grows to about 17 centimetres. And the, the crazy, crazy thing is that, yeah, that's big, but baby beetles are bigger than the adult beetles. So, um, yeah, exactly. How do they give birth, then? <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool to see. Uh, but no, 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 so they lay an egg. The life cycles are just remarkable. So taking something like a long horde beetle, like the titan beetle, would probably have the case that the eggs are laid and it will grow into a larvae and then it will stay as a larvae in, in, the, in the soil, in the rotting, rotting wood, perhaps five to ten years as a larvae before emerging into an adult in which its adult lifespan is perhaps maybe two or three weeks. Just remarkable that they've evolved this really wonderful life cycle. I remember going to New Zealand, to Watomo, which I think is a wonder of the world, really, the modern world. I don't know if you've been there, but it's the glowworm caves there. <laughs> And there are so many glowworms in this cave that you can read under the light wow. that they produce. It's really stunning. And I interviewed uh, one of the people who was taking us around on this tour. And he said, it's a pretty miserable life if you're a glowworm, though, because you live in the roof of this cave and you produce this light and dangle down your fishing line thread to catch insects and things, which you then eat and devour. Your sole aim being to get big enough to then turn into a fly which doesn't actually have a mouth. So yeah. you're born and you live as long as you can survive with the energy you've already packed in in order to just find a mate, mate and die. But what a glorious L way to go. Life's a bummer. And then <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to take her out for a meal <laughs> before you get what you want. <laughs> yeah. David, I can see it's clearly a romantic lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> When's your next anniversary? <laughs> What about intelligence in insects, though? Because we think of ourselves, we have this very, very mm. kind of superlative view of ourselves, don't we? We think as we're at the top of the pinnacle of, of intelligence and things. Are insects particularly clever? There is so much more going on in invertebrate cognition than perhaps many people are aware of. I always feel like we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what many species are capable of. So taking, for example, bees, there's always so many lovely experiments done on bees. There was this absolutely lovely experiment that was done showing that you can train bees to tell the difference between paintings done by Monet and paintings done by Picasso. And if that's not a higher cognitive ability, I, I don't know what is. And which do they prefer, then? I, I don't think they went that far. I don't think they... <laughs> <laughs> or wasps, they can tell the difference between individuals by their different facial markings. Again, bumblebees, there was a, another lovely experiment done in which they essentially trained them how to play golf, and, uh, <laughs> which was just a great experiment. They, they trained them to push a little ball to go down a, and a hole, and then they get a treat if they got it. And they're very capable of, of learning uh, different they, tasks they like were, this. I remember reading that because that was done at Queen Mary University of London, yeah. and 
we talked to them about that, and they said, not only can you train a bee, but a bee will train another bee. Yeah. So the bees will watch the other bee do it, <laughs> and then they can copy. Yeah. So they can play golf and waste their life away Exactly. As well. <laughs> Questions. Uh, this one came in from Stephanie. Stephanie says, I read that an endangered Komodo dragon can give birth without a male. If so, how? Wow, that is a very good question. I don't know anything about Komodo dragons, but I do know something about snails. So individuals... Yeah, no, no, it's irrelevant, I promise. Um, <laughs> so so um, snails, like Sherlock Holmes here, is both simultaneously male and female, so has the ability, when they can't find a mate, to, to self-fertilise themselves with their own sperm. So I know that's what snails do. Do you know how Komodo dragons do it? Is it the same? Yeah, it was 2006, and it was actually at London Zoo. And they had a Komodo dragon that was female. And they were most surprised when they got another Komodo dragon from one single yeah. female Komodo dragon. This is a process called parthenogenesis. And unlike humans, when we have sex and you mix eggs and sperm, if you have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, you get a man. If you have an X and an X, so an X sperm and an X egg, you get a girl, female. Now, with Komodo dragons, there's actually three different combinations of genes they can have, but we'll leave that to one side for one moment. It suffices to say, if you have the equivalent of two X chromosomes in a Komodo dragon, you are male. If you have two different chromosomes, you're female. So if you have a female Komodo dragon that, say, washes up on a beach, and it's one female on its own, it's going to have two different chromosomes. But because it's got the ability to then make an egg, which has only got one of them in it, that egg can then turn into, by copying the chromosomes, one that's got two sets of the same type of chromosome, XX, and so it has a male baby. That's amazing. And that means you've then introduced into a population of what would be exclusively females, a male, and they can then reproduce sexually again and in in introduce genetic diversity. That is so cool. So yes, that is, that's how they do it, Stephanie. We are <gasps> almost at the end of our show, but... We did call this show Boom the Naked Scientist, didn't we? So I think it would be a little poor to leave you without actually giving you a proper boom. And remember Katie at the start mentioned about covering your ears? Well, we're getting into that part of the show now. So I'm going to go over to Dave, who on his table has an ominous metal canister. So Dave, what is in the ominous metal canister? So in here we have something which is a little bit chilly by physicist standards. It's not particularly cold, it's definitely chilly. Mine is 196 degrees Celsius. So a little bit, a bit nippy. You'd bit want nippy. a jacket. This is what happens if you take normal nitrogen, which we're surrounded by in the atmosphere, and cool it down to minus 196. And I'm guessing that this smoking plastic cup full of bubbling liquid is something I don't want to drink? People have done this and died horribly. Um, okay. so, <laughs> so that's a definite no then. So th this is ni nitrogen, it um, liquefies at minus 196, which means if it gets anything above minus 196 degrees Celsius, it boils. We can see kind of what effect that will happen on a liquid, li liquid boiling by first cooling down this balloon. Don't feel sorry for a balloon, this is a first. This is a balloon I blew up with just my own breath earlier. You'll notice something happening to it. So you're putting the balloon in the thing, and that is far too big a balloon to go into that flask normally, so when you pull that out of the flask... You have a tiny apple-shaped little balloon. And if, I don't know if you can see the little bit of liquid which is sloshing around in the bottom. Can people see the little thing sloshing about there? Yeah. Yeah. So that tiny amount of liquid is boiling to blow up the whole balloon again. So is that, is that the air that's turned to liquid? Yeah, so we've liquefied air, which uh, um, takes up much less space than gaseous air. Um, so the balloon shrank. And now it's boiled again and it's expanded about a thousand times blowing up the balloon, which is why swallowing liquid nitrogen is a really bad idea. <laughs> Expanding would be bad. I don't want to be this balloon. Yeah, because basically um, you're 200 degrees Celsius above nitrogen's boiling point. It's going to apply an immense pressure as it tries to turn into a gas, and basically you're not going to be able to contain it. So, pausing for effect, <laughs> what can we do with putting liquid nitrogen in somewhere we're probably not supposed to unless you have scientific supervision. <laughs> I've written many, many risk assessments over the years. So this is actually one of the 
two major ways you can kill yourself with liquid nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other one is by going to lift with it or in some kind of confined space it excludes all the oxygen and you just suffocate this is fun um, <laughs> but, the, but the one we're looking at today is putting it into a sealed container so our fizzy drinks bottle just a half litre fizzy drinks bottle so we have a half litre fizzy drinks bottle here I'm first going to put on some ear defenders because <laughs> they will come in handy later <laughs> Thank you. I was about to ask, where are my hair defenders? <laughs> um, and I'm now going to pour in some liquid nitrogen. At the moment, this is completely safe, apart from my, my fingers might get a little bit chilly. <laughs> so not completely, but relatively. <laughs> so this is pouring into a fizzy drinks bottle and smoking like a horrifying mad scientist experiment. So the point at which this becomes dangerous is if I put the lid on the bottle. Because lemonade bottles are incredible pieces of modern engineering. They cost a, just a couple of pence, and they're incredibly strong. They'll fail at maybe 10 atmospheres. So 10 times the pressure we feel now. Which is about 100 tonnes per square metre. It's so a lot. A lot of pressure. So putting the lid on is what makes this dangerous. To do that, I'm going to come over here. <laughs> Safety first, we have a wheelie bin. We have a wheelie bin to contain anything flying out. There's a wonderful video on the Naked Scientist website of this blowing up with no wheelie bin, and it's petrifying. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to put the lid on and then shut the lid very quickly. Okay, three, two, one. <laughs> and then we wait. Anyone else a little nervous? Yeah. Just going to slowly creep. Across the stage. <laughs> What's happening very slowly, possibly more so than <laughs> intended, because I think it missed the water. Oh! No! <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure built up until it went bang. And it just fails and explodes. <laughs> well, I think, of all things... Dave Ansell absolutely deserves a massive round of applause. For and I'm now deeply scared of your arm, this canister, and I'm going to creep over here and get my hearing back. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please join me in saying a very big thank you to Giles Yo, to Liliana Frook, David Rothery, and Eleanor Drinkwater. And Sherlock. Thanks also very much to Adam Murphy and to Dave Ansell and Katie Haler put the programme together. And that's it for this week. Join us again next week for more Naked Science when we'll be looking at radioactivity. How was it discovered and how has it changed the world? Plus, we take a peek at an upcoming film about the life of Marie Curie. The Naked Scientist podcast comes to you from Cambridge University and is sponsored by Rolls-Royce. From me, Katie Haler, from Adam Murphy and Chris Smith, thanks very much for listening and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>